him so that the drive is directly to the wheels. A year later, we have a different conception. This locomotive was designed by Edward Berry. As is often the case, a new Victorian locomotive seems in some ways to be a throwback to even earlier designs. Made for the Furness Railway, this one has inside cylinders. It also has two pairs of wheels coupled together, so giving four rather than two powered wheels, with consequent increasing grip on the rails. This engine was conspicuous for its copper-capped semicircular firebox, and it's always been known as copper knob. The logical extension of all this is seen in the 060, one of thousands of freight locomotives with this arrangement, ideal for heavy loads, if not for speed. This one is a tank engine. No tender is needed as for short trips, all water and coal can be carried on board the one chassis. For some railways, goods trains of immense length form the backbone of their services for the rest of the century. The oldest working locomotive in Britain combined two previous design features in its wheel arrangement. The Lion, built for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1838, was a six-wheeler and had two pairs of wheels connected, an 042. It was passenger traffic that gave the greatest impetus to locomotive design. The railways brought unheard of mobility and almost all sections of the population travelled by train. The class divisions of Victorian society were reflected in their railway carriages. This is a third class carriage of the 1830s. And as you can see, it's a pretty primitive affair. There's no roof, so your third class passenger would almost certainly lose his hat, probably get drenched by the rain, and get a lung full of locomotive smoke as well. But he did have seats, rudimentary though they were. Earlier than that, the third-class passenger would have to stand. It was the Midland Railway, whose compound we have seen in action, that was the first to improve the lot of the third-class traveller. In 1875, they abolished second-class and upgraded third. This is a Midland third-class compartment of 1885. Spartan, but not at all uncomfortable. And with this increase in comfort came an increase in weight. This six-wheeled coach weighs 18 tons, six times more than the third-class truck I was in just now. And with increased weight, there came the need for more powerful and stronger locomotives. A notable railway passenger as early as 1842 was Queen Victoria. This is her sumptuous Royal Saloon of 1869. Her patronage of rail travel undoubtedly gave it a powerful social sanction. Yet, strangely enough, development of locomotives in the years around 1850 had become relatively static. Indeed, it's been argued that every major advance in locomotive design from about 1841 came from overseas, reminding us of Defoe's observation that the English improved everything and invented nothing. But then, money was short after the great expansion of the railways in the 1840s, and energy had been expended in the Battle of the Gauges. The weak wrought iron rails used until the 1860s would permit little increase in locomotive weight. As the 1860s drew to a close, things began to change. Traffic increased, financial confidence ebbed slowly back, if only for a while, and most important of all, wrought iron was replaced by the much stronger metal, steel. Then in 1870, the year after Queen Victoria first stepped aboard that coach we've just seen, and almost halfway through her reign, the Great Northern Railway astonished its rivals and its friends alike 
with the new creation of its locomotive engineer, Patrick Stirling. This most famous of Victorian railway engines became known after the most conspicuous feature of the locomotive, a large single driving wheel on each side. It was called the Stirling Single Wheeler. Stirling had a keen eye for pleasing appearance, and that alone is sufficient to explain why his locomotives became so famous. But not everyone was rapturous about their beauty. One complained that these dreary-looking austerities were remindful of a Scottish Sunday on a wet day, and that the uphill and downdale running plates suggested the designer couldn't make up his mind. The same man found the cab one of the dreariest-looking profiles ever designed outside of a Scottish funeral hearse. But that was very much a minority opinion. Now, although in some respects this Remarkable locomotive has many innovatory features. In other ways, it is absolutely typical of the steam locomotive in Britain through the whole of the Victorian era. This small pair of wheels, as in the 222, was to take some of the weight of the rear end particularly the firebox. It carried about eight and three quarter tons. Being small, the wheels left plenty of room for the firebox. Now we come to the most distinctive feature of the whole engine, one pair of enormous driving wheels, eight feet one inch in diameter, six inches larger than in an engine of this wheel arrangement designed by his predecessor, Archibald Sturrock. Sterling had always been partial to single wheelers, now he wanted something that could move even faster than any previous example. These mighty wheels between them supported 15 tons. Finally, we have a front bogey, a four-wheeled truck supported by a pivot. Sterling said this was to lay hold of the track, but also it had to support the huge cylinders. He didn't like cylinders on the outside, but with eight feet driving wheels, he thought a crankshaft driven by inside cylinders would be unable to take the strain. Here on the locomotive, you can see how exposed the engine crew were to the weather. The cab's very small. In fact, the engine men preferred it that way, and they complained that some of the earlier ones were too all enclosed. In very bad weather, they put a tarpaulin right across there and uh, keep the rain up that way. Now, today, the engine's being driven by John Bellwood, the chief mechanical engineer of the National Railway Museum in York. I see you're notching up there, John. Can you tell us what you're doing? Uh, yes, we're reducing the travel of the valve that distributes the steam to the cylinder and using the steam expansively and therefore more economically. This cuts off the supply of steam to the cylinders at an earlier point of the piston stroke and makes for greater economy at speed. See, we've got a very healthy pressure up. Well, enough. <laughs> they used to go up to 140, didn't they? When they were first built, they had a, they were 140, and the pressure was gradually raised over the years as train weights increased. Yeah. Uh, this one's running at a reduced pressure in deference to its age. thing you've got here is the... Oh, uh, this is the regulator. This controls the admission of steam from the boiler to the steam jet for the cylinders. Really, it's sort of accelerator. It's a sort of throttle on the car, accelerator, yeah. See, we've got the distance on here, and it looks as if the home signal's still at danger, so we'll have to stop, for, yeah. unless it pulls it off. So, yeah. obviously, the other main control is the brake, which we shall very shortly be using. We just put the blower on a little to take the draft off the fire, and now I can close the regulator. Uh, drop the lever into forward gear and now we're approaching the uh, home signal at danger. We'll keep the signal on a whistle.
way. They just ease the regulator gently when you're starting in the hope that you will not cause a split. Better with wheels that size. Well, big wheels and of course only one pair of wheels, therefore relatively limited indeed. Less conspicuous than the actual motion was a simple device low down in front of the driving wheels. It dropped sand onto wet or greasy rails and helped to prevent slippage, particularly important with wheels as big as this. Later on, steam jets were used to force out the sand. Steam sanding devices almost certainly extended the life of single wheelers for many years in the last century. Sterling single wheelers became the backbone of Great Northern Express running to and from King's Cross until the end of the century. They could be fast, up to 86 miles an hour, but chiefly they were reliable. So reliable that a half minute delay on the Peterborough run was worthy of surprise comment and a remark about immoderately bad weather. The brake pipe connection you can see on the buffer beam was never there in Sterling's day. He would not allow that any of his single wheelers would need assistance from an engine in front. Their prowess and consistency were legendary. Both were demonstrated in 1888 and 1895 in the epic struggle for supremacy between East and West Coast main lines. Only the Great Northern used exclusively single wheeler engines in the great railway race to the North, and then always on their own. Many times during the contest, the West Coast trains were hauled by this engine of the London and North Western Railway. Its magnificent performance showed that human skill and endurance are just as important as good locomotive design. On the final night of the contest, this engine covered 141 miles from Crewe to Carlisle in an incredible 126 minutes. Rebuilt in 1892, this is a 240 where the coupled driving wheels once again give extra grip and power. This was to be needed from now on as the old six-wheel coaches were replaced by longer vehicles with a bogey at each end. Coaches towards the end of the century became increasingly plush and increasingly heavy. There were restaurant cars like this one, sleeping cars of great luxury and blissful thought for the long-distance traveller corridor connections between coaches and toilet facilities as well. All this added up to a great deal of extra weight. This coach weighs 42 tons. With the extra weight, there came the need for yet another generation of even more powerful locomotives to pull these heavy trains. Here is a member of that new generation. Number 563 of the London and South Western Railway, introduced by Adams in 1879-80. The front bogey had a sprung suspension, which gave it better side play than in the Sterling single wheeler. And of course, it's another coupled engine, a 440. Despite the reservations that Sterling had expressed about such an engine being like a laddie running with his breeches down. It simply reminds us that in Victorian times, the British steam locomotive did not evolve in any specific direction. It varied pragmatically with the insights, ingenuity, and even the whims of its designers. The Midland Railway, for example, had a small engine policy. So even the Midland compound with its extra high pressure cylinder, from which spent steam then goes to the other two, was insufficient for the heavy trains early in this century. And often two locomotives had to be used together. But such was the foundation of solid achievement in the Victorian era and the durability of its products that engines like this remained in active service almost to the end of the age of steam.